Hello and welcome to today's revision session where we're going to look at advanced energy which is part of the GCSE separate science and combined science in physics. So the first topic we're going to look at in this revision session is specific heat capacity. So in the particle model we should always consider all forms of energy stored in a particle structure and there are two types of energy stored inside the particles of a substance. There's the potential energy store which is the intermolecular forces of attraction between the particles which have also got the kinetic energy store which is due to the particles moving or vibrating. Now in the particle structure these two forms of energy are referred to as the internal energy of the substance. So the internal energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy of all of the particles in a substance. So in this topic we're only going to consider the kinetic energy of the particles. We're only going to consider the factor that determines the temperature of a substance. So it determines whether heat can flow between objects. Now the factor which determines the size of the kinetic energy store in a substance is called the specific heat capacity. So we can work out the energy transferred into or out of an object due to the change in the kinetic energy store or heat with the equation E equals M times by C times by triangle T, where E is the energy transferred in joules, M is the mass of the substance in kilograms, C is the specific heat capacity in joules per kilogram degree Celsius and delta T is the change in temperature or triangle T is the change in temperature. So we can rearrange this equation and say that the specific heat capacity is equal to the energy transferred in joules divided by the mass in kilograms multiplied by the change in temperature in degree Celsius. So therefore the specific heat capacity of a substance is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of the substance by one degree Celsius. And different materials have different specific heat capacities. So every object in the universe is made out of particles and we can use the particle model of matter to work out the particle structure of the substance and the energy that these particles have in total is the internal energy of the substance. Now part of the internal energy of the substance is the kinetic energy of the particles. That's how much the particles move or vibrate. So the kinetic energy can be changed by changing the temperature of the substance. Now the other part of the internal energy of the substance is the potential energy of the particles. That's how much the particles are attracted to each other. Now we can change the potential energy store by changing the state of the object. So the internal energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, but it has to be considered for all of the particles in the object. So in this particular uh, topic, we're going to look at how we can change the kinetic energy store of the substance by placing thermal energy into or out of the object and there are three factors which contribute to the thermal energy placed into a substance. So you've got the mass of the substance in kilograms, you've got the change in temperature the substance undergoes in degrees Celsius and we've got the specific heat capacity of the substance which is measured in joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. So you change any one of these factors you can change the kinetic energy store or thermal energy store of a substance. So the larger the mass the greater the amount of thermal thermal energy stored. The larger the temperature, the greater the amount of thermal energy stored. And the larger the specific heat capacity, the greater the amount of thermal energy stored. So for example, water has a high specific heat capacity. This means it stores a lot of energy. It's actually 4,200 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So when one kilogram of water is heated by one degree Celsius, it stores 4,200 joules. So the amount of work done needed to heat one kilogram by one degrees is 4,200 joules into the substance. The higher the specific heat capacity, the more kinetic energy that can be stored before your temperature changes. So there are many examples where specific heat capacity is very useful in the real world, such as a storage heater. So a storage heater uses electricity at night when it's cheaper to actually buy from the national grid to heat special bricks or concrete blocks in a heater. Now the bricks have a high specific heat capacity so it can store lots of thermal energy, which means that they warm up slowly whilst being heated, but it also means that they cool down slowly when it's switched off 
and, and, and heating a room up for a long period of time. So we can use the equation we mentioned previously to work out either the heat energy transferred into or out of a substance or the specific heat capacity of a substance. So say for example an aluminium block of mass one kilogram has a change in temperature of eight degrees celsius and a specific heat capacity of 900 joules per kilogram degree celsius what is the energy transferred so you use your equation e equals n times by c times by change in t so it's one times by 900 times by the change in temperature which is eight so it's 7200 joules remember to always include your units with your values another question could ask you a gold block has a mass of one kilogram and has a change in temperature of 30 5 degrees Celsius and the energy transferred into the block is 90,000 joules. What's the specific heat capacity? So now we say C is equal to E divided by M times by change in temperature. So it's 90,000 divided by 35 times by 1. Remember that 35 times by 1 is a sum which is done first. So that is 2,600 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So what this means is that uh, gold needs 2,600 joules to heat a 1 kilogram by 1 degree Celsius. Now it's my advice in these equations to always write out the values first in the equation that you know. E equals M times by C times by triangle T and then rearrange the equation afterwards after simplifying some of the terms. The next topic we're going to look at is the specific heat capacity required practical. So in this investigation you're, you need to work out the specific heat capacity of a material from every experimentation. So you'll need a metal block, a power pack, wires, a thermometer, a stopwatch, an immersion heater and a voltmeter and ammeter. So you connect a heater to a 12 volt power pack placed into an aluminium block, connect the ammeter, power pack and heater in series, connect the voltmeter across the power pack, turn on the heater and with the stopwatch measure the time allowing the heater to warm up for three minutes in the block. In this time record the current and the potential difference in the circuit. After three minutes record the temperature of the block with a thermometer. That's our start and temperature. Reset the timer and begin the time and heating process. So every minute record the temperature of the block and then calculate the work done into the block where energy is equal to power, sorry, potential difference times by current times by time and you carry this out until 10 minutes have elapsed. So you retrieve an aluminium block. Now most aluminium blocks have their masses stated on them in this particular example here. So now clarify specific heat capacity specific means per kilogram. So the ideal scenario is to have a block which is one kilogram. You retrieve an immersion heater and place it into the block. Now the immersion heater is going to provide the thermal energy into the block. So it'll increase the thermal energy store of our block. So the whole heater should be in the block. If it's not, it's an error in the investigation because we're measuring the energy supplied by all of the heater. And in this particular picture, half of the heater is not actually heating up the block. It's heating up the air. You're going to need a power pack and some electrical wires. You set your power pack to 12 volts. You retrieve an ammeter, which is going to measure current in the, in the circuit and it's going to be placed in series. You're going to get a voltmeter which measures potential difference and it's going to be placed in the circuit in parallel. You'll retrieve a stopwatch and use a stopwatch to time the investigation. You connect the heater, the voltmeter and ammeter into a circuit with the power pack as shown before. Now remember the voltmeter is placed in parallel across the heater, the device it is measuring, and the ammeter is placed in a series circuit which means in a loop. You turn on the power pack and allow the heater to warm up for three minutes which minimizes the error in the investigation as otherwise you'd be waiting for the heater to get hot. Now you then start your stopwatch recording the current and potential difference readings on the ammeter and voltmeter and you assume that the values don't change in throughout the investigation but obviously that's not the case and a source of error in the investigation. Every minute record the temperature of the block using the thermometer carried out for 10 minutes but when you measure results ensure you stand in parallel with the thermometer as it reduces parallax error in your results. So you fill in your observations in the following table. The temperature of the block is measured by using the thermometer in the experiment, so the values are recorded at the same resolution as the thermometer. Our energy transferred is equal to energy times by current times by potential difference times by time. And to make this easy, because you've got multiple resolutions, you can round this answer to the nearest whole number. You can then fill in the values of current and potential difference, which are recorded at the start of the investigation, and we assume that they do not change in the investigation. We then record the values to the same 
same resolution as the measuring devices, the voltmeter and the ammeter. And we're going to use these values to help us work out the energy transferred. We we'll then draw a line graph with the temperature of the block on the y-axis and the work done on the x-axis. is shown, sorry, the other way around, the temperature on the x and the work done on the y-axis. You will then draw in a line of best fit. The gradient of the line is the heat capacity. So what you then do is you would work out your gradient by drawing a triangle on your line of best fit. Make your triangle as large as possible. Work out your change in y and your change in x. So gradient is change in y over change in x and you can use that to work out the specific heat capacity of your substance. The next topic we're going to look at is insulation. Now, in any energy system, energy cannot be created, it cannot be destroyed, it can only be transferred between different stores. So energy can be transferred usefully, stored or dissipated, but can't be created, can't be destroyed. Now, in a closed system, we assume that energy flows completely between two different stores. Now, the process of energy changing stores is called doing work. Okay, so what goes on, however, is in the universe, in reality, when energy is transferred, when work is done, there's always some energy dissipated to the surroundings, and we commonly call this waste energy. So when energy is dissipated, it is stored in less useful ways, because to dissipate energy means to spread it out. So what happens is, when work is done, some waste energy is dissipated to the surroundings, so this makes it less useful to use. Now, thermal insulation is used in the universe to reduce this dissipation in the inter to the internal energy of the surroundings. So what this means is it will prevent effective heat transfer to the internal energy store of the surroundings. So if the object is hot, it will remain hot. If the object is cold, it will remain cold. Now, thermal insulation can be found in many different places, such as double glazing, cavity wall insulation, human body hair, coats and jumpers. Now, to understand how materials can be thermal insulators, we must consider how energy transfers across a material. Now, energy transfers across a material by the process of conduction. So energy transfers across any solid material by the process process of conduction. And therefore, the faster the energy transfer, the better the thermal conductor, the slower the energy transfer, the better the thermal insulator. So the rate of energy transfer across the material is called thermal conductivity, and all materials have a value of thermal conductivity, but the higher the thermal conductivity, the worse the insulator, because energy is transferred more quickly. So, but the lower the thermal conductivity, the better the insulator as energy transfers slowly. So in the example to our right, the best thermal insulator is polyurethane foam as it has the lowest thermal conductivity out of the four selected. Now, in addition, the greater the amount of solid material, the longer it takes for energy to transfer out of a material. So if you increase the size of your material, the energy will take longer to transfer out as well. So another factor which affects the rate of energy transfer is the thickness of the material. So there are two factors which affect how good a thermal insulator a material is, thermal conductivity and thickness thickness. The lower the thermal conductivity of the material, the better the thermal insulator the material is. The thicker the material, the better the thermal insulator the material is. So thermal energy is transferred from a hot object to the internal energy of the surroundings. And energy is transferred through a solid material by conduction. The thermal conductivity of material is a measure of how quickly conduction occurs. The higher the thermal conductivity, the higher the rate of energy transfer, the worse the insulator. Now two factors affect how good a thermal insulator a material is, its thermal conductivity and its thickness. Now it's important to note that even though thermal insulation minimizes heat transfer, it doesn't completely stop it. Consider thermal insulation as someone who wears something which slows down energy transfer, like a person getting stuck in the mud. Energy is stuck inside a solid insulator. Now eventually a person can get out of the mud, but they've been slowed down. And energy eventually gets out of a solid insulator, but it's taken longer than it should do. Now, the person gets out of the mud by walking through the mud, and energy gets out of a solid insulator by the process of conduction. So in our final part in this revision session, we're going to look at the insulation required practical. So in this investigation, we're going to work out the effect of a material thickness on the thermal insulating properties of a material, which links into the following part of the AQA A-level, sorry, the GCSE physics specification. So we're going to need a 250ml beaker, a thermal thermometer, a kettle, a piece of cardboard, scissors, stopwatch, newspaper and rubber bands. You'll use the water, the kettle to boil water, pouring 300 mils of this hot water into a 400 mil beaker. We'll use a piece of cardboard as a lid for the beaker and the cardboard must have a hole for the thermometer. 
or then insert the thermometer through the hole in the cardboard lid so it has its bulb in the hot water. We'll record the temperature of the water and start the stopwatch. We'll record the temperature of the water every 5 minutes or 25 minutes. And after this has been carried out, calculate the temperature change from the start of the investigation. We'll then repeat the investigation for different layers of insulation around the beaker. And one layer of one wrapper of a newspaper around is around the beaker. And you secure the newspaper insulation with elastic bands. So in this investigation, you would use varying thicknesses of insulation and our insulation in this case is going to be newspaper so you would need a section of 10 layers 20 layers 30 layers 40 layers and 50 layers now ideally you would actually share results as a class as otherwise it would take too long to do so but in addition to having layers of insulation around a beaker you will also need to carry it out the investigation out on a beaker which has no layers of insulation a control beaker you will so you'll boil a kettle to gain hot water you will then get one 400 mil beaker wrap your selected value of insulation thickness layer around the beaker and ensure it's done tightly then you'll secure the layer of insulation with an elastic band you'll place the beak on a heat proof mat now the heat proof mat will act as a source of insulated material for the bottom of the beaker if this was not done this would be a source of error in your investigation so you'll carry it out for one value of thickness each so we've got control 10 20 30 40 50 you then retrieve a thermometer and our thermometers have a resolution of one degree celsius so this means the temperature cannot have any decimal places recorded because it's a me it's measured to the resolution of the measuring device you'd retrieve a a lid for the beaker you'd retrieve a stopwatch which has a resolution of 0.01 seconds so this means time should be recorded to two decimal places with the hot water from the kettle fill the beaker up to 300 milliliters you'll place a lid on top of your beaker now this is to prevent the heat loss from the top of the evapor of the beaker via evaporation again if this was not done this would be another source of error in our investigation because so, in this practical we're looking at the effect of heat loss via conduction not evaporation you then record the temperature of the beaker once the temperature the thermometer is reading the right temperature. So the thermometer should read the right temperature when it's been immersed in the hot water for about two minutes. You then use the stopwatch to measure time, record the thermometer of your beaker every five minutes. You'll carry this out until you've completed the reading for 25 minutes. You'll do 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes. And during this time, you can collect results from other groups who may have carried out the experiment. Now ensure when you are taking a measurement from your thermometer, you are standing parallel otherwise you will have a parallax error so standing parallel to the thermometer reduces the effect of parallax error which is a random error on your experimental results now this could also be reduced by repeating your investigation multiple times and calculate an average because repeats reduce the effect of random errors which parallax error is a type of in your investigation you then record your results in the following table and produce a line graph with time on the x-axis and temperature on the y-axis and have two lines on your graph one for an insulated beaker and one for your control beaker is such like so so what you would then do on a second graph is draw a bar chart with the number of insulation layers on the x-axis and the temperature change on the y-axis for all data collected and then you can conclude which uh, which how so which layer of thickness is the best insulator now remember insulators reduce the effective energy transfer so the best insulators have the smallest temperature change now in this example we're cooling down so it's a temperature decrease but it's exactly the same if you were heating it up it would be a temperature increase change but the best insulators have the smallest change in temperature and the worst insulators have the highest temperature change now uh, let's summarize what we've learned in this revision session the greater the mass of an object the more slowly its temperature increases when heating because the rate of temperature changes depends on the energy supplied to a substance the substance's mass and its specific heat capacity now the specific heat capacity is the amount of energy to heat of one kilogram of a material by one degree Celsius. So energy transferred in joules is equal to mass in kilograms times by specific heat capacity in joules per kilogram degree Celsius times by the change in temperature in degree Celsius. Now energy can be transferred usefully, stored or dissipated, but cannot be created, cannot be destroyed, and you should be able to describe examples where there are energy transfers in a closed system, but there's no net change to the total energy, and you should be able to describe with examples how in all systems changes energy is dissipated, so it's stored in less useful ways, which you often describe as wasted. Now, thermal insulation is a material which reduces heat transfer in a substance. The best thermal insulators are materials which slow down heat transfer a lot. Now,
Now, most insulators work as they have a low thermal conductivity as it reduces the transfer of energy by conduction across the material. Now, students should be able to explain ways of reducing unwanted, unwanted energy transfers, for example, through lubrication or with the use of thermal insulation. Now, the higher the thermal conductivity of material, the higher the rate of energy transfer by conduction across the material. Now, students should be able to describe how the rate of cool of a building is affected by its thickness and the thermal conductivity of its walls. So I hope you've enjoyed today's revision session where we've looked at advanced energy, which is the topics in GCSE separate science and combined science. Thank you very much for listening to today's revision session and have a lovely day.